Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining today. Our topic is methods of flame detection. My name is Carlos S. Korski. I'm a product manager at FireEye. So let's get started. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about combustion and combustion basics. So combustion can exist in one of three fundamental states. And those are perfect combustion, complete combustion, and incomplete combustion. This diagram shows a little bit about how perfect combustion process would work. You're going to have a component of air as well as a component of fuel, and together those are going to make up exhaust. And each air and fuel component is going to be made up of different chemical elements as well as the exhaust. With perfect combustion, this is the theoretical outcome of a combustion process where all of the air and fuel would be consumed in the process. This is also known as stoichiometric combustion, and with perfect combustion, no CO is produced. The percentage of CO2 in the exhaust is going to be at its highest with perfect combustion. While perfect combustion is the theoretical outcome, complete combustion is the practical outcome of a combustion process. This allows for the continued safe operation despite, despite small changes in the ambient conditions. A mix of air and fuel where each, where there is more than 100% of the oxygen required, also known as excess air combustion or fueling combustion. With complete combustion, there will be CO, but in acceptable amounts. The percentage of CO2 in the exhaust begins to get lower as the percentage of O2 and excess air rises. With complete combustion, you're on the safe side of this stoichiometric mix as the percentage of CO2 in the exhaust decreases from the theoretical peak. And the other reason your complete combustion is preferred is, going back to the ambient conditions, if your temperature of your air changes, for example, that would change your perfect combustion. And if you're right on um, the threshold of perfect combustion, you might actually go to the dangerous side of combustion if you didn't have any um, room for error. So incomplete combustion is the opposite. Uh, this is where the mix of air and fuel is less than 100% of the oxygen required and is also known as fuel-rich combustion. A rising amount of CO to a potentially lethal level uh, can be produced as the oxygen deficiency increases. The percentage of CO2 in the exhaust also lowers, same as with complete combustion, as the O2 deficiency increases, except as the CO2 percentage decreases, you are on the dangerous side of the stoichiometric mix. With combustion, there are three T's, time, temperature, and turbulence. First T, time. When a fuel is burned, sufficient time must be provided for the fuel to burn fully. If allowed to only partially burn, there will be losses as unburnt fuel. And if too much time is allowed, the burner may not be able to achieve the desired power output, so it wouldn't make its rate. If the temperature is not sufficiently high, fuel will take longer to ignite. This may result in a change to the power output as well. Low NOx burners actually take advantage of this principle to lower the flame temperature by reintroducing exhaust gas into the combustion process. This is commonly known as FGR, or flue gas recirculation. This lower temperature inhibits the chemical reaction between nitrogen and oxygen. Thorough mixing of the air and fuel is necessary as well to achieve proper combustion, and this is turbulence. If this is not done, there may be partial combustion, which can result in increased emissions or also reduced power output. Most types of burners used in process control will require, by applicable code, that there is a flame safeguard and instrumentation system in place. Control can further be divided into two categories a combustion control system, or CCS, and a burner management system, or BMS. The combustion control system regulates the furnace air and fuel inputs to maintain the air-fuel ratio. This ratio must be within the limits required for com continuous combustion and flame stability throughout the modulating range, allowing the burner to safely adjust output from a minimum output to a maximum output in a linear manner. Servo motors are used to regulate dampers on the air as well as valves on the fuel 
to precisely control the input at all stages of combustion. This process also provides repeatability whether the burner is increasing or decreasing in output. PID control is often used in conjunction with the modulating burner output to control a process variable to a defined set point. The burner management system, or BMS, is a, dedicated, is a system dedicated to burner safety. The BMS controls the safe starting and stopping of burners. A BMS can be programmed using an industrial PLC or a complete microprocessor-based BMS, which is also known as a flame safeguard, can also be used. Regardless of type, a BMS has inputs and outputs to connect all the required parts of the burner. A BMS can be designed for a single or multi-burner application. Basic components of a BMS system are interlock monitoring, fuel monitoring, flame monitoring, ignition control, as well as main burner control. FireEye manufactures a variety of flame safeguards that satisfy the requirements for a burner management system. Some of our models are the Flame Monitor, Burner Logix Y and Z, Burner Pro, SB Series, Micro M, and we also have the NXF 4000 and NX6100, which are integrated combustion control systems, uh, which are, B are BMS systems with integrated combustion control systems for air fuel ratio control. All required and any optional interlock inputs are connected either in series to a dedicated input or to specific inputs where internal logic will monitor the status of each individually. The status of these inputs can be enunciated as required via SCADA or HMI. The interlocks may individually or collectively require a manual reset upon a fault condition depending on the applicable codes or design. Some required interlocks uh, that you might typically see are air pressure switches to monitor combustion air, low water cutoff devices for pressure vessels such as boilers, high temperature or pressure limit devices, and emergency shutdown buttons. Incoming fuel pressure is monitored to ensure there will be adequate fuel for combustion. There is typically an interlock for monitoring both a minimum and maximum allowable pressure for each fuel that is present. This monitoring can use an analog input or multiple digital inputs via adjustable switches. The switches and or BMS may require a manual reset following a low or high fuel pressure incident depending upon the applicable codes or design. The flame monitoring system is designed to lock out the BMS whenever the actual state of detected flame does not match the desired state of flame. This can either mean that the flame is present when it should not be, or most commonly that a flame is not detected when it should be. A parameter known as flame failure response time dictates how long a lack of flame must be present before a flame failure is reported. This can vary from under a second to as long as four seconds depending upon the applicable code and design. There are three prevailing technologies that are used in flame detection. First is ionization, rectification via flame rod. Next is radiation via infrared scanning. And lastly, radiation via ultraviolet scanning. The ignition system can vary depending upon the fuel used. In any event, the ignition system provides the energy required to begin the combustion process for the main fuel. The BMS begins by running the combustion air blower and purging the firing vessel. The purge may occur either with an open damper or a closed damper for a fixed period of time, and the time period will depend upon how much air you're trying to move through the vessel, and ignition will follow the purge period. One method of ignition is where the ignition source, such as a spark electrode, directly ignites the main fuel output. This would typically be the case when the fuel source is an oil, such as number two. When this is the case, the ignition output precedes the main fuel trial for ignition period, which is the amount of time that the main fuel has to prove a flame before the flame failure is registered, and this could be as long as 15 seconds. The other method of ignition is where the ignition source ignites a gas-based pilot, which is usually propane or natural gas. The ignition output precedes the pilot fuel trial for ignition period, which is the amount of time that the pilot has to prove a flame before a flame failure is registered, which is up to, again up to 15 seconds, similar to the MTFI. After the PTFI, the main fuel valve is opened and the control enters the main trial for ignition to prove the main flame. Once the main fuel valve is opened and the flame is proven during the MTFI period, the burner is in the normal operating mode. This is the point where the CCS can take over the management of the air-fuel ratio control and modulate the output. 
At any point during operation, if the flame is not detected for the flame failure response time duration, the BMS will lock out the burner and a manual reset will be required to restart. If the burner is shut down in a normal manner, the BMS will initiate a shutdown sequence, which may include a post-purge of air by running the combustion air blower for a fixed duration, possibly with an open damper. FireEye manufactures several combustion control systems. We have the PPC-4000 and PPC-6000 systems, which interface with an external burner management system or flame safeguard. We have the, and we have the NXF-4000 and NX-6100 systems, which are integrated burner management systems with combustion control systems. So they do flame safeguard and air fuel ratio control. So now we're into the methods of flame detection. So first we have the flame ionization principle. So heat in the flame causes the molecules in and around the flame envelope to collide with one another. The force of the collision frees some of the outer or valence electrons of the atoms forming the molecules in the flame. This creates free electrons and positive ions, which actually allows a current to be conducted through the flame. The whole process is called flame ionization. Within the flame, there is very low conductivity and resistance can vary from 100,000 to 100 million ohms. Uh, therefore, current conducted through the flame is, is very low, typically in the range of 2 to 4 microamps. The amount of current indicates the intensity of the flame. So if two electrodes were placed in a flame as shown to the, in the image on the right here, and a voltage was applied, a current could be conducted through the flame, uh, through the two flame rods. The issue with using two flame rods is that a high resistance short to ground, in other words, if you touch them to each other, which could simulate and would simulate a flame signal. This could be potentially hazardous. So to avoid this, the flame current is rectified. Generally referred to as flame rectification system, this is achieved by placing a grounding electrode in the flame, which is several times, generally four times, larger than the flame rod or electrode. An AC supply voltage is applied across the electrodes. In the first half cycle of AC, the flame rod is positive and the ground rod is negative. The positively charged ions will flow into the negatively charged grounding area. Since the grounding area is larger, the flame current is significantly higher for one half of a cycle than the other. If there is a short, the current will be consistently high and the flame detection system or flame safeguard will reject the signal. Flame rods are small diameter metal rods supported by an insulator. The tip of the rod projects into the flame. They are typically made of a high temperature alloy or ceramic material. So applications for flame rod or rectification flame detection are generally found in the supervision of gas fired flames. Requirements for successful applications typically include that it's a gas fired burner. Grounding area is at least four times greater than the flame rod area. Stable flame with no physical movement from the flame rod itself, so the flame rod is stationary. The flame rod is kept as short as possible for adequate coverage in the flame, and proper rectifying flame current and associated circuitry are provided. Here's an operational diagram for the flame rod. In the image on the left, you can see the normal AC sine wave at the top and how the, the peaks are equally distant. And at the bottom, you can see the rectified current, and you can notice that the peak on one half of the AC cycle is about four times higher than the other, and that is how it can differentiate between a short and an actual flame signal. The image on the right shows the circuit and how it manifests into actually detecting the flame, showing the flame rod protruding into the flame itself. FireEye products that support using flame rods include our Flame Monitor, BurnerLogix Y, Burner Pro, Micro M, and SB Series Flame Safeguards. So flames emit radiation along a wide band of electromagnetic spectrum called the flame spectrum. This spectrum consists of ultraviolet, visible, and infrared radiation. Ultraviolet and infrared radiation are at the opposite extremes of the flame spectrum, and only wavelengths of 400 to 800 nanometers are visible to the human eye. It can appear as various colors, such as blue for gas flames or bright yellow for oil flames. Flame detectors are selected to detect one of these types of radiation, and each will have benefits or drawbacks. 
Ultraviolet radiation makes up only about 1% of the total flame spectrum. It is most abundant in the first third of a burner flame. More ultraviolet radiation is present as the flame temperature increases. Infrared radiation makes up about 90% of the total flame spectrum. It is most abundant in the last two-thirds of a burner flame. Hot furnace parts such as refractories will begin emitting infrared radiation when above 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Flame scanners operating in the ultraviolet wavelength use a detection tube. In this type of system, the flame is considered present when ultraviolet radiation is detected. Differentiation between the targeted flame and neighboring flames is achieved by discriminatory sight or scanning or scanner sighting, meaning where you're physically aiming it. This focuses as much as possible on the targeted flame and then signal sensitivity adjustments, either internal or external, and threshold settings help tune out unwanted signals at the controller. Ultraviolet detection tubes should be sensitive only in the far wavelength range of 200 to 300 nanometers to be considered solar blind. Solar blindness is important to prevent stray light detection from sources other than the flame spectrum. Ultraviolet detection tubes are made from quartz. The tube is then sealed and filled with gas and contains two electrodes connected to a source of AC voltage. So the, the detection tubes are shown here on the right. And they look similar to a light bulb. Electrons are released and gas within the tube becomes conductive through ionization. An electric current flows from the cathode to the anode and if a high AC voltage is applied to the electrodes, an arc is produced only when sufficient ultraviolet radiation is present. And again, this will manifest as, as looking as if a light is turning on. A quartz lens is used to focus the UV radiation through the optical shutter window directly on the detector tube electrodes. Voltage across the electrodes will be zero for the first half cycle of AC. This allows the tube to restore itself to a non-ionized or quenched state. On the second voltage half cycle, current is re-established across the electrodes if sufficient ultraviolet radiation is present. The number of firings during each cycle is called the count. When a flame is present and ultraviolet radiation enters the tube, the system begins to count. When there is no ultraviolet radiation, counting stops. The flame control relay electronically manages the count, and when a preset flame on threshold is reached, an output is set to indicate the presence of a flame. This output remains active as long as the threshold is satisfied. The count relates directly to the intensity of the ultraviolet radiation. Ultraviolet detection tubes can respond to sources other than the targeted flame, such as hot refractory, but unlike infrared where this will occur at around 1000 degrees Fahrenheit, with ultraviolet it has to be much hotter around 2000 degrees Fahrenheit can also respond to spark ignition, welding arcs, or halogen lights. The gas inside the tube can eventually degrade, leading to random failure modes where the count may occur even without a flame present, and this is a false flame indication. This can be detected by the flame safeguard or flame control since there will be a flame present when there should not be one. The issue is that the burner has to shut down and restart for the flame safeguard to notice this. A type of ultraviolet scanner called a self-check was developed for this situation when a burner does not cycle. Self-check may also be required by applicable codes when a burner does not cycle within a specific time period, and 24 hours is a common time period for this. The self-check contains a shutter that physically blocks the ultraviolet radiation from reaching the tube, and the flame safeguard or flame control is designed to expect the interruption to the count and continue operation without issue. The duration of the self-check test must still be less than the flame failure response time or lockouts can occur. And here is a schematic of how an ultraviolet uh, system works, showing the electronics as well as where the flame uh, reaches the bulb at the right, uh, the physical manifestation of sensing the flame. All FireEye products offer a UV scanner option. Most are also available with a straight or side viewing option as well. Models that offer self-checking UV scanners are a flame monitor, burner logics Y, Z, micro M, SB series. Infrared and visible light, which is greater than 400 nanometer wavelength, do not effectively detect 
the presence or absence of flame by themselves. Reliable detection of the targeted flame requires that the infrared detector distinguishes between the modulating frequency of the radiation it receives. Infrared radiation from a flame in, is in many frequencies, and this is known as the flame flicker. During the combustion process, there are many small explosions, each emitting visible and infrared radiation. Flame scanners operating in the visible and infrared spectrum use a lens, photo detector, and a solid state frequency tuning circuit. The flame consistently moves, changing shape and brightness. The, the function of the photo detector is to monitor flame flicker to distinguish between the targeted flame and any other sources of radiation. The photo detector most commonly used is the PBS or lead sulfide photoresistor. The PBS cell lowers its electrical resistance relative to the amplitude of radiation. Flame flicker frequency is noted in hertz and frequency can be as low as 5 hertz or upwards of 200 hertz. So on the diagram on the right, you can see with a steady source of light that doesn't flicker at all, that's just a solid light, you will not have any movement, so you will you see the line is flat. With an actual flame, the flame flicker is creating the lines that move up and down, um, and that is how the different amplitudes are detected from the radiation at each position of the flame. The ability of the photo detector to detect flame flicker frequency can be adversely affected by low frequency radiation from furnace background light or other sources of heat. Strong sources of this low frequency radiation will have a saturation effect. Also called washout, saturation inhibits the ability of the cell to maintain a high enough electrical resistance value. This renders it unable to monitor flame flicker properly. To minimize this saturation effect, cite the detector so that radiation from the ignition zone is maximized and radiation from furnace background is minimized. Infrared scanners may also offer background gain control or sensitivity adjustments to tune out background signals. You can see from the picture on the right, if you have a wider area that you're looking at, the background radiation will have more effect on the flame you sense. But if you narrow down the field of view to the flame you actually need to see, you can mitigate a lot of that background radiation by physically changing your sighting. Here's a schematic of infrared scanner showing the, the wiring as well as on the right where the flame actually comes in and the, the physical manifestation of the flame scanning. Many FireEye products offer an infrared scanner option including the flame monitor, BurnerLogix Y and Z, Micro M, as well as the NXF64000 and NX6100. For each fuel, there is going to be a method that would work best based upon the radiant energy present within, with the associated flame. Other considerations are going to be the distance to the flame as well as the response time required. UV detection is the fastest, but performance degrades as the distance from the flame increases. UV also doesn't work as well where the environment around the flame is smoky. IR detection can work well with a moderate response time at longer distances from the flame. So in this table, you can see the amount of radiant energy present in different types of fuels. Uh, with air atomized oil, you're going to have most, inf more infrared radiation than you will ultraviolet. With steam atomized oil, you will have more infrared again, and you'll have much less ultraviolet than with air atomized. And that's most likely because with the steam atomization of the oil, you're going to have more of a smoky environment, which does not work well with ultraviolet. Gas with an air premix is low on the infrared radiation but high on ultraviolet. And gas with no premix is about medium on both infrared and ultraviolet radiation, so either, either would work equally well. Integrated flame scanners are available that can be mounted to site the flame and provide a flame relay output to a BMS or SCADA system. They can also provide a fault output when there is a flame failure and some may provide an analog output to indicate the strength of the flame. An integrated flame scanner is going to have outputs, uh, again, for the fault relay and the flame out relay output, indicating the flame is present. Uh, it's going to have a power supply input as well as an analog output. And in the schematic on the left, we can see the scanning scanner sighting uh, from the scanner tube into the flame. An integrated flame scanner is going to typically mount to the burner using a threaded connection or flange so that it can be easily removed if servicing is required. 
You can also get an orifice, which can narrow the field of view so that this, to help the scanner um, see the targeted flame better and not see any background noise or background flames. There's also a swivel or gimbal mount available so that you can position the scanner to aim any direction you want and then tighten that down and it will maintain that position. Integrated flame scanners can also mount remotely and connect to the burner using a fiber optic connection. This allows a connection into tighter spaces or when access requires it. And you can see on the right with the fiber optic cable, because of access you may need to locate the scanner a little further away and the fiber optic cable allows you to get the angle you need to see what you need to see. Integrated flame scanners are also available that contain both ultraviolet and infrared sensors and can be programmed specifically to one targeted flame in a multiple burner environment. Since each flame has unique amplitudes of modulation or flame flicker, the flame scanner can be programmed to learn the specific details of the proper flame. Some have multiple relay outputs for connections to the BMS that can be individually programmed to provide either redundancy or outputs to multiple locations. A programmable interface on the flame scanner, or in some cases a PC connection tool, may be used to program the specific settings and adjustments you need. So uh, these are our FireEye integrated scanners. So first is the Simplicity. An overview of this, the Simplicity is a fully integrated scanner that does not require any programming, which makes it very easy to use. It has an 8-pin quick disconnect connector. It's 24 volt DC powered. It has a flame relay and a fault relay, a 4 to 20 milliamp analog output for the flame signal. It has a two-color LED for simple status enunciation and it is class 1 div 2 and ATEX hazardous area rated. The Phoenix 85 series, uh, similar to the Simplicity, has the 8 pin quick disconnect, 24 volt power, flame relay, fault relay, 4 to 20 milliamp, but it also has a keypad setup uh, to help set it up, as well as a multi LED status indicator for flame indication. The Phoenix 85 series is also class 1 div 2 and ATEX hazardous area rated. The inside scanners offer self-check models available for detecting ultraviolet radiation, infrared, or both in the same unit. So this one is a little bit different. Uh, it has the 12 pin quick disconnect, also 24 volt powered, but it has uh, a flame relay, fault relay, 420 milliamp analog output, keypad with display for monitoring and programming. It also includes inputs to select a fuel profile to use, and there are four available. Adds Modbus communication. Uh, by default, it's class one div two rated and can be ATEX hazardous area classified with a proper housing. Insight series four, similar to the Insight we just covered, uh, and it uh, has all the same features. The Insight two, is going to have two connectors on it, an 8-pin and a 12-pin quick disconnect connector because it has two flame relays instead of one. It still has the fault relay. It offers two 4 to 20 milliamp analog outputs instead of one for flame signal and flame quality. Still has four available profiles, Modbus communication, class 1 div 2 as standard and ATEX hazardous area classification is available with the proper housing. The Insight 2 display is available to mount directly onto the scanner, is one option. There's also a wireless transmitter option for the Insight 2. You put the transmitter on the scanner and you use the receiver, the handheld receiver, to program settings or to monitor operation. For hazardous areas for the, all the Insight scanners, an ATEX approved housing is available for the Simplicity and Phoenix. By default, they're going to have be ATEX approved. FireEye also offers Explorer software for remote communication, and it's available for connecting a PC to multiple Modbus compatible Insight or Insight 2 scanners on a network. Each scanner can be monitored or controlled remotely using the software. There are additional features such as trending to help troubleshoot any issues you might have with the flame. So FireEye integrated scanners can also be used with FireEye flame safeguards, and the specific models that you can use with each flame safeguard will depend. So you would check the bulletin for the flame safeguard, but in general, the compatible models are the Burner Logics Y can use the Phoenix 85 series or the Insight 95 series. The Micro M can use the Phoenix 85 series or the Ins 
or sorry, the Insight 95 series. The NXF 4000 and, and it, it can use the Phoenix 85 series and the Insight 95 series. And the NX6100 can use the Phoenix 85 series scanners. So that's it for today. I hope you guys found that informative. And I will follow up with everybody with an email. And if you have any questions, uh, you can respond to that. And again, thanks. And have a good rest of your day, guys.